Welcome to All Space Considered, everybody. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and with me tonight is Vanessa Alarcon, Paul Netro, and Rosemary Williams. And uh, thank you, everybody. And tonight's program is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and the City of Los Angeles, of course. And we always like to thank our nonprofit partner, Griffith Observatory Foundation, and everybody that's made donations and all the members. We greatly appreciate your support. Well, we have a great show for you tonight, and uh, it is the, oh, I'm, we're already on the screen, I have to remember that. It is the, the third Thursday of the month, March 21st, and tonight we have stories about JWST Brown Dwarf, large-scale structure, star and planet formation, type 2 fake out, not a supernova, <laughs> this will make more sense later to you. These are things I just called them. Um, and then we actually have a type 1A supernova, kinda. Um, a type 2 remnant. What are these types? What are they talking about? Well, it's exploding stars. The picture in the background's a little bit of a hint. Um, and then there's a strange star with a weird metallicity signature. In other words, it's made of weird chemicals. And lastly, um, the black hole story. Did, it's a little earlier in there. The one I was going to do, we did drop. It fell into the black hole. So. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I know. So, alas. Um, and all these stories come from the 243rd meeting of the American Astronomical Society. It's a society that I belong to. And um, every year there's a couple of meetings. The big one is in January. And most astronomers uh, head there, especially a lot of young astronomers that need to get their name out there. They're looking for jobs. So you get a lot of really fresh science, a lot of great things. And uh, this year we had a little zoom and enhance there. Um, there were the plenary sessions, which those are the invited talks, the award speakers. You can go watch these online. You can see them on Vimeo there, as you see. So if you're interested in seeing some longer lectures that really dive into the science, you can do that. But tonight, we're going to talk about things that came from the press conferences. And as you can see in the far right there, it says press activities. And some of those activities are actual press conferences where, well, they talk about all the major discoveries, things from the smallest <laughs> objects up to some of the largest structures that we study in the universe. And we're going to start off with something on the smaller side. In fact, Paul is going to tell us about um, a couple of brown dwarfs. But what is a brown dwarf? Is that like yes, a D&D character? That is a <laughs> great question. So brown dwarfs are kind of difficult to categorize. That's kind of what defines them in a way. They exist somewhere in between what we think of as planets normally, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, large gas giants, and stars. So they start off about 10 times more massive than Jupiter, and they go up to just under 100 times more massive than Jupiter. And just to give you a scale size, they are smaller than even the smallest red dwarfs. These are objects that are really, they defy categorization in a lot of ways. Uh, but one thing that we can say about them pretty consistently is that they're self-luminous. They're glowing from the inside out. Uh, now, this is the HR diagram. This is sort of the, uh, the way we organize different types of stars. The lower part, you'll see that color bar is higher temperatures where you see the blue, and then going off to lower temperatures as you get all the way down to that MLNT part. And brown dwarfs exist all the way on that coolest, dimmest part of the scale there. You've got them circled right there. Very cool, very dim objects. The ones we're talking about are actually going to be even cooler than the ones that were on that HR diagram. We're going to be talking about the Y-type brown dwarfs. Uh, the other three types are a little bit warmer, a little bit more massive. The white types are basically really hot Jupiters that are slowly cooling down. Now, in this particular case, we have... Yeah. An now, those letters are just categories, right? Yes, they're just categories. Yeah. They're fun to say melty, but it's just sort of an idea of how we can space them into different groups. <laughs> and this particular brown dwarf is just an artist's depiction because we've never seen one directly, uh, not with optical wavelengths anyway. These objects are way too dim, way too dark. Um, they're mostly glowing in infrared which is why this particular paper is focused on data from the James Webb Space Telescope. And Jackie Faraday and their team from the American Museum of Natural History have discovered something pretty extraordinary. With the precision data from James Webb Space Telescope, we have compared two brown dwarfs. Now, these objects are both at a very similar distance, less than 50 light years away, so this light is relatively fresh. Uh, they have a very similar temperature. Uh, I know that's a weird number, 482 Kelvin. Just for reference, that's about the temperature of a oven baking cookies. 
So you're almost a familiar temperature, right? And just like in oven baking cookies, you put your hand next to it, you're going to feel that infrared heat. They are glowing in that infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, their mass is a little bit harder to categorize. We don't have a really good way of ascertaining the mass of an object that's so dark and so by itself out there in space. But comparing the light curves, the sort of the image that we get in the infrared part of the spectrum, we spread out all that infrared light, and we see which parts of it are getting blocked. And unlike a star, we see a lot of things blocking that light. Uh, brown dwarfs have chemistry happening in their atmospheres. And in this case, we can see W1935 in blue and W2220 in white. And they have water and ammonia. We've got carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and this is the part that's interesting to the scientists on this team, the methane. So we're going to zoom in onto that methane part. And that white line, that is W2220. That's its absorption part, it's showing that we are having light in the infrared part of the spectrum absorbed by that methane. But there's that bump in the blue part. That bump is telling us that something is causing methane around W1935 to glow. And for a while, the team was trying to figure this out because there's not a whole lot of explanation for why this data would look like this. Um, they actually went back, double-checked, made sure that the data was fine, made sure their analysis was fine. This is the real data. This is correct data. Yeah. The well, only thing they to, can do... Well, to make methane glow, you have to have energy. Yes, yeah, something it. has to be energizing this methane. And in our solar system, there is a similar situation happening around Jupiter. Jupiter has massive aurora. Uh, so that patch of blue at the top of Jupiter spreads out over five times the diameter of the Earth. Huge, huge set of auroras. They're being caused by one of Jupiter's moons putting a little bit of extra energy into the upper atmosphere of that planet, causing it to glow. Now that is unusual. This is sort of implying some pretty interesting stuff happening around this brown dwarf. And it is actually kind of blurring the lines between brown dwarfs and planets even more. Again, brown dwarfs are kind of difficult to categorize as to one thing or another. Uh, just to show you a little bit of what the team decided to sort of wrap this up was, they think there might be a moon around this object. Or, well, it's kind of hard to say what you would call an object or companion to a brown dwarf. It, uh, if you decide they're more like stars, it'd be a planet. Decide they're more like planets, it's more like a moon. Um, you could borrow a word used for something else and call it a plunet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that is the, uh, the sort of starting small and exciting and a little bit unusual. But it just sort of gives you a little bit of spice of, of what these scientists are doing. They're trying yeah. to be on the cutting edge of these researches. Yeah, well, it's it, seeing an aurora around an object that's not in our solar system at all is remarkable. It's and then a free-floating brown dwarf like this, this is this is pretty neat work. It really is. Um, so thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, we're going to go from the smallest object. I mean, it's not the smallest that was talked about at the meeting. They were talking about exoplanets and things as well. But still, brown dwarf's pretty small to really large structures. In fact, this topic's called large-scale structure it is indeed. in the universe. So, Rosemary, what, what do you have for us here? So, this is very exciting. Before we get into it, to give you a sense of the scale we're looking at, we have our, our star system, right, the solar system, where we have our sun. Our sun is part of a larger star system that is the, the Milky Way galaxy, right? And then the Milky Way galaxy is a part of an even larger galactic system that we call the local group. You can think of these as like our, our galaxy neighbors, right? These are the ones close to us. Beyond our local group, our local group is part of the Virgo cluster or the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. In fact, this hopefully looks a little bit familiar to you guys. I don't know if you've caught it yet, but I'll, I'll enhance it a little bit so you can see. You guys got it yet? It's our big picture Aww. in the depths of space. So <laughs> Markarian chain. It's the Markarian chain. I love it because it looks a little bit like a little worm, like a little face there. You can see it. Um, but we have the big picture down here in our depths of space. It's the largest photo of outer space in the entire world. So hopefully you guys get a chance to see it. Um, but this Markarian chain on the grand scheme of things is still pretty small. Um, there's this little animation for you leaving, right, leaving our Milky Way galaxy and looking at even larger structures. So galaxies are clustered together in galaxy clusters, and then these clusters are kind of pulled together in these intricate large-scale structures that you can see 
in that animation there. We've kind of mapped the observable universe in this, in this image here. You can see kind of the distribution of, of galaxies across what we can see so far. And what you might notice is that it all looks pretty similar, right? If I pointed to one area versus another, it all kind of looks the same. This is a very important um, basis in astronomy. It's called, the, it's called the cosmological principle. It is kind of our, our basic assumption in astronomy and in cosmology, which, is, uh, which states that on large scales, the universe is isotropic and homogenous. That just basically means that wherever which way you point, whichever position you are in in the universe, it's going to look basically the same, right? You, you aren't going to have any wild structures out there. You're just going to have galaxies kind of spread around evenly. Now, this definition um, seems great when you're when you're looking at it, um, but what does large scales mean, right? Who gets to decide what a large scale is? Because I mean, for me, like, you know, Los Angeles is pretty big. It, it would take a long time to like get across Los Angeles, especially at you know rush hour and things. But like looking at like cosmology, what does large scales mean? So um, astronomers have kind of defined large scale as 1.1 billion or 1.2 billion light years in size. They basically state that nothing can be bigger than that because. Um, it would take too long for information to travel from one star to another star to one galaxy to another galaxy to form a structure that big um, in the time that the universe has been around. However, in 2021, a research group at the University of Lancashire presented what they called the giant arc. And this arc um, was about 3.3 billion light years across. So breaking that model by about almost a factor of three. Um, Maybe it's just a fluke though, right? Maybe it just happens to be that these galaxies are kind of in this shape. Well, this past January, they presented that they have found another extremely large scale structure. This one they called the big ring. You can see it circled right here. This big ring is almost 4 billion light years in circumference. So once again, just breaking kind of that, that principle that we've set. Now this isn't to say that all cosmology needs to be like thrown in the trash, not at all. <laughs> this is just saying that our understanding might need to change and grow. Um, because if we've been able to find two large scale structures in just a few years, it's likely that, that there are other large scale structures out there. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense of how big these would appear in the night sky, if you were to go up and be able to see this structure, um, this is about how big they would be, right? They, they would cover a massive amount of the sky. It would take 15 full moons to cover the entire big ring there. So this is just an incredible um, discovery that they found. And I look forward to kind of understanding how we, how our understanding of, of cosmology changed because of it. Yeah, it's, we're not supposed to have things that big out there is, is what yeah. it comes down to. And you, you said that, but it's, it's shocking to astronomers to have something that flies in the face of our models of how these galaxies get distributed and put together. Mm -hmm. Now there's a very small chance that you could make a structure like this. Sure. Yeah. Cause things are random out there and random things can happen. So when we found the big wall, we thought, well, maybe, maybe even though it's this really small chance, maybe we just got lucky. And now they find a ring. Yeah. It's like the second one. All of a sudden you're like, well, now did we, what are the odds we got lucky twice? It'd be like going into, well, I grew up in Reno and I'd be like going to the casino and you pull the slot machine. You hit triple seven. I won the jackpot. You put in another token or quarter. You pull it. Triple seven. I won the jackpot. You're not supposed to hit that twice in a row. <laughs> That's just uh, so unlikely. But neat. If they, I wonder if they're going to keep finding more. Yeah. That's, I, they hope. might. They might. Yeah. yeah. Well, now we're going to take a series of stories that were presented at these press conferences and weave them into a little bit of a tale. This is a star forming region you're looking at here. Um, a beautiful part of space where glowing gases that were made in the Big Bang and you know, released from stars collapse together to make new baby stars. So new stars are formed in a place like this and um, the most massive of them will live their lives and blow up, and that can actually cause a shock wave that generates even more stars. So it's a process that on goes and sort of is, is a cycle, really, to think about. And that's where this image comes in. You can see in the middle the star-forming nebula. That's where we're going to make these stars. And now let's pay attention to the left-hand side. Just above, it says protostars. Those are the little baby stars that are forming, and it will eventually become a sun-like star, a red giant, and move on down the line and, and die as a planetary nebula. On the right-hand side, you can also have a protostar that's going to make a massive star. A lot more material is going to go into it. That star's like Betelgeuse, the huge one we have up on our, our uh, diagram upstairs, our, our Sun is a Star exhibit, um, the giant red one. Anyway, they explode as something we call a supernova. 
and can blow up and make things like neutron stars and black holes. And that material can get recycled back into the nebula. Well, this process is studied by astronomers, but do we have any real proof of it? Well, this is the Orion Nebula and the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, before I get there, we, we always thought a process like this would happen within the nebula. And this is an animation. This is a, a simulation. Well, not even a simulation. It's an animation showing what we thought would be going on. That gas would collapse into a disk. The materials would slowly collapse together and stick together and make things like comets and little planetoids. And eventually the star down in the center starts to glow brightly, kicks off its nuclear fusion, and you end up with a baby solar system. We're making a comet here that'll fly in towards the center here any second. Gravity pulls them together. You can see the pieces get bigger and bigger. And eventually that disk of material will kind of be eroded away as you make objects within it. And eventually you'll make planets. And the baby star is born down inside when the, the nuclear fusion kicks off. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope saw evidence of this. These little propylids, as they're called, these little things you're seeing in each of these squares, are basically baby stars. You see the glow at the end. You see the dark gas that's there. And some of them, like the one uh, fourth down from the top on the left-hand side, you can see a little glow in the middle and what looks like a dark disk around it. So this evidence of, wow, are we really seeing star formation happen? Are we really seeing planet formation in, in process, perhaps? Well, it took this telescope here, and you're like, that doesn't look like a telescope to me. Those look like radio dishes. Well, they're <laughs> microwave dishes. Well, submillimeter, technically, that's the wavelength. All of those are combined together to form a single image. They, they do what's called aperture synthesis to make a telescope that's the equivalent of kind of the distance that they're spread out. And they were able to get, and that's, that's down in Chile, by the way. It's the ALMA Observatory. Um, they were able to get images like this. And that's showing the glowing gas and dust down <laughs> around these stars. And you can see, you know, there's a little bright object in the middle. And on the far right-hand panel, you can even see that little glowing dot that's in the gap that's probably a planet forming, probably a, pl a little baby planet being made. Now, um, even more images have been taken. They got many, many more of these. And you can see some of them have rings, some of them have gaps. These are fascinating looking things. And the population has got large enough now that um, this researcher, I hate to mispronounce his name, but Sheng Han Xie, I don't know how to pronounce that. I think I'm, it's Shu. Shu, is it? But Shu is, anyway, it could be. But Shu is, uh, other Shus I've seen spelled differently. Frank Shu, who just passed on, actually, um, worked sort of in this realm with disk instabilities and things. So kind of appropriate to say his name. Anyway, um, the compost team did this work, and they were able to go in and analyze these disk structures from Alma, and they were able to say some of them are very young, only a couple hundred thousand years old, and that's when we think the giant planet formation is happening in these systems. Some of them have gaps in the middle, um, some of them don't. You can see some of them um, with multiple rings they think are larger, the ones that don't have multiple rings are smaller, so the small ones are in the top of this image, the bigger ones are in the bottom. Literally, they're scaled to match each other's size, so if it looks small on this this image, it is small. If it looks big, it is big. The relative sizes are correct. And the bigger ones tend to have more rings. Um, if you look here, you can see as they get older, um, oh no, this is the two population one, right? The donut. On the top, you can see they look a little bit like donuts. There's a hole in the middle. In the bottom, they look a little bit more like, I don't know, the, the Bavarian cream filled ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, you know, they're a filled donut. There's, there's filling in the middle. Why? Why are they that way? Nice hot jelly. Yeah, maybe it's a hot jelly one. I do like a good jelly donut. Um, multiple ring systems tended to be centrally filled as well. So if you have lots of rings in them, well, they tended to be full in the center. Why? We're, we're not sure. Um, but the fact we have enough data now, and this telescope's imaged enough of these, they're able to start pulling this stuff around. And it seems like structures, substructures, only starts to appear after about 300 million years after the star, star forms. Um, so very interesting work. They're working on doing more and more with this, and we'll see. Alma will continue to it, it find more and more of these objects and build a bigger population, and that is how science is done. You get a big sample, and you can start to build the picture of what's happening as they age, what's happening with the young versus the old, the massive versus the less massive, and maybe they'll start to see planets in these too. Now, you might ask, well, could the Webb telescope, JWST, be used on this sort of a system? And the answer is yes. This is from Webb's MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. 
And um, this is something that we, the colloquial call the cat's tail, as you can see off in the right. This object is a disk, and the disk is, the primary disk is going across left, right, here. And there is a secondary disk that kind of goes this direction, and there's this weird cat's tail. <laughs> Why does it have a cat's tail there? We don't know. It shouldn't be there. <laughs> it's, that sort of a structure will rapidly disappear, um, probably within, I, I would guess within you know, dozens of years, probably 100 years, certainly. It depends on its distance from the star. But they think maybe a collision happened. Maybe two protoplanets collided with one another. Mm -hmm. Material was given off, and this is the leftover, you know, the debris left from the collision. So yeah, the Webb telescope could be doing that. You can see the main disk plane there and the extended secondary disk, which they're not supposed to have two disks either. That could be a sign of this collision. So neat stuff. Um, th this takes us back to our, I'm, I'm gonna use this slide over and over again as sort of a holding place um, for what we're talking about. So this got us to the protostar stage Stars then ignite their hydrogen generally and start forming helium in their cores, and they'll be very stable for most stars billions of years. Our own sun is about halfway through its life at about five billion years old or so. Um, but stars can go through some tough times during their life, depending on the conditions they face, their mass, how they live, and as they get near the end of their lives, things can change. Definitely. Um, yeah, yes. so Vanessa has some <laughs> stories about this tonight for yes, us. Yes, I do. So uh, the type of stars that he's talking about, the typical ones that are usually like main sequence stars, but then you get a bunch of weird ones that are like really, really massive. And you get something like RWCPI, which is a hypergiant star. So this star is very big. It's uh, about a thousand solar radii. So uh, they're not 100% certain about its exact size. It can range between somewhere between 900 and uh, 1400 solar radii, but it's a really, really big star. It's one of the largest ones in uh, our, so our galaxy that we know of. Uh, Do we so know how far up that takes it? Would that engulf? You mean the, the... How many planets would that engulf, a thousand solar radii? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway, someone in the booth calculate that for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How far out does it go? Well, All right. RWCPA that's at least out to Saturn. I think it's Saturn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like Jupiter, Saturn. It's far. Yeah. But don't yeah. quote Paul or I on this. <laughs> <laughs> so it big, very big. <laughs> so, so yeah. So these stars like this are extremely massive. They're if they're on the HR diagram, they're all the way on one extreme side. They're very. This one in particular is very red, uh, very red, kind of cool, but really, really big star, very bright. Uh, so it's kind of unstable in a way, where it's it's uh, it kind of coughs up. Well, you'll see in a minute. So, uh, <laughs> so here is what we call a light curve. So this is the how bright the star was over a time period. So people took measurements over and uh, recorded how bright it was on each day. So you can notice here on the right side, there is a huge dip. And basically, scientists are like, we need to take a closer look at this to see what's actually happening here. And they took a much closer look at it. So uh, if you've ever looked through a telescope, especially the ones we have here, uh, you'll see stars, and they're very, very small. So you can't actually see the surface of the star the same way that you can see our sun's surface, uh, at least not with regular telescopes. So uh, we saw a radio telescope array that made really a really giant telescope that goes over a large piece of land. Um, but that's radio waves. But there's actually a telescope really nearby that can make a really big telescope, uh, but with optical light. So that's really hard to do, uh, but they did it here at the Chara Array, which is at Mount Wilson, which you can actually see from Griffith Observatory. That's yeah, so, a big sister. Yeah, mm. yeah, very tied in history, Griffith Observatory with Mount Wilson. Uh, but yeah, there is actually a science array up there. This this is uh, six telescopes, and basically you combine the light uh, to make a giant telescope. So like the one you see there on the right, which is kind of a funny image where just imagine a mirror that's that big. Uh, it's covering like a large portion of the mo of mountain, which I think is funny. Uh, so they were actually able to take a picture of kind of the surface of the star, RWCPI. So uh, let's take a look. So... 
When it dipped in brightness, you can see there on the left side, uh, it's kind of a weird shape. Um, it is a little bit actually covered by dust. So the star was coughing up material because it's kind of unstable, and that material was blocking our view of the star's surface. So on the right side is when it started getting a little bit brighter. They actually took a bunch of measurements of it uh, as, as it was dimming, and then as it was the faintest, and then as it started coming back again. And if it's kind of hard to get a sense of what's going on here with this picture. It's, it's you know, still really far away. <laughs> uh, but this is an artist's uh, conception of what was actually happening. So that dust cloud was in between us and the star, so it's really kind of blocked out part of the view. So it, it wasn't really, well, the star was doing something, but uh, it, and it was unstable, releasing material, and blocking out itself, which is kind of cool. Um, so that actually kind of leads into a very similar story with a different star that instead of being really cool on the surface, it's actually really hot. Uh, so this is an image of Eta Carina, um, and there it's it was a it is a blue luminous a luminous blue variable star. Excuse me. Uh, so. This star is extremely bright, also unstable, uh, but also for different reasons. It's very, very blue. It's very hot. Uh, so it ejects material very uh, all the time uh, or with a very specific periodicity. So uh, we'll watch it kind of outburst at different times. And it kind of looks like this. So this is another light curve. Um, and you can see it has a pretty steady brightening, and then it gets it, dimmer. It looks like a pulse. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very much like a pulse, yeah. Uh, so it's doing something similar where it coughs up material, and then you get the, the dimming area right there at the bottom. Uh, but this is what it looks like. So these stars, again, unstable. But Rosemary, just, did you want to talk about this? I would love to talk a little bit more about unstable stars. <laughs> So um, one of the other things they presented at the AAAS conference, um, a research group was studying a star that was very peculiar in NGC 3432. You can actually kind of see where it is in this picture right up here at the top. Um, so zooming in there a little bit, they discovered this kind of wonky star that looked like it had sort of gone supernova. And then when the dust cleared, so to speak, the star was still there. Um, they called this star SN 2000 CH or like supernova 2000 CH. Um, and this is kind of a, a light curve of what that star looks like. So um, you can see that our SN 2000 CH, it was kind of bright and then dim and then bright and then dim and bright and dim and they found this by collecting data from a lot of different sources, a lot of different papers and I think that that's kind of like a great summary of astronomy is everyone working together. You can see in just this you know, short little graph here how many research groups contributed to this data over many years. And this research group discovered that on a scale of about um, once every 200 days or so, it, the star looked like it would just kind of explode and then it would still be there, which is kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's very similar to Eta Carina in that sense and that Eta Carina also underwent a very large expo explosion in the 1800s and left it with this beautiful nebula around it with the star kind of remaining in the center. Now the periodicity though, um, understanding why it's once every 200 days, right? Because with unstable stars, why is there kind of a regularity to it? This kind of uh, a little bit confusing. So one of their theories is that there is an orbiting companion star, and basically that star is interacting with this luminous blue variable star that's very unstable. And when it re when that orbiting star reaches periastron, which is just a fancy way to say the closest point to that second star, it disrupts material and causes that second kind of eruption of material or second explosion of material, um, causing that periodicity of about 200 days. Now it's worth noting that um, the the team was like hesitant to like officially classify it as a you know as a in, in a specific classification right because there isn't that much um, data on it but the whole point was just to be like this is a really cool star it's doing something weird let's look into it further and that's kind of what astronomy is all about is understanding weird things and wanting to learn more um, and so I love that yeah, it's, it's yeah. kind of funny that there's a there's a chance that there's an unseen companion to this one as well, just like mm -hmm. that brown dwarf. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's just interesting stuff. So folks that were looking at our title slide there, that was the supernova imposter, the this one that the imposter. was getting brighter. And then we had the one that's not a supernova, <laughs> but people were wondering, because the one was labeled even SN, and it yeah. wasn't a supernova. Yeah, it wasn't a supernova. Mm -hmm. so, um, this is why we verify. This is how science works. This is a little bit of a lesson on science. Pe sometimes people complain and say, well, scientists, you're changing your mind on things. <laughs> 
well, I heard, you know, previously there was going to be an ice age, and now you're saying it's global warming. Why should I trust you? Well, be because we're changing with the evidence we see. That's why you should trust us. Yeah. We gather more evidence. We change our hypotheses, on our models, to match what we see in the universe. That's what science does. So in this case, we need more information to really understand these luminous blue variables and what's going on. So exactly. fun stuff. Fun stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so back to our, our little diagram here to keep you appraised of where we're going with this. We had our nebula. We made some protostars. We had some massive stars that were doing things, getting near the end of their life, or maybe so massive the, the light itself is making these things unstable. You have companions coming by. Well, you can also have stars like the sun just live their lives happily. And then um, as they die, they'll give off a planetary nebula, it's a beautiful object, and leave behind a white dwarf star. Well, if there happens to be another star, if it's a binary system, two stars that are orbiting one another, well, the white dwarf on the left-hand side there, you can see it's sort of bluish in color, can't get close enough to the other star that when the second star swells up as it dies, it can dump material onto the white dwarf. And if it does that, that white dwarf can actually, well, it can blow up. <laughs> so um, in this case, the second star was a helium star. It had a lot of helium on it and was dumping that helium onto the white dwarf. That helium, if it gets dense enough, can fuse. It can undergo um, what's known as the triple alpha process, a complicated name, but what it really means is three heliums to come together and they make carbon. Yay. Yay, I know, it's a fun thing. <laughs> well, that white dwarf down inside is mostly carbon and oxygen. And as that extra burst of energy from the outside happens, you can actually cause what's called a double detonation supernova. That first detonation is the, the shell of the star exploding, compresses the inside, heats it up, and causes that inside to completely blow up and leave nothing behind. But what it does leave behind is some carbon, some silicon, some calcium. These are these letters you're seeing in the lower corners of each of these boxes. And what you're seeing is the direction and the velocity this stuff was thrown off from the star when it blows up. So, And that first one up on top is the first explosion, the first detonation, and then the second detonation down below. This isn't measurements. These aren't data they measured with a telescope. This is a simulation. And they thought, well, we should see these things out there. They should exist. We had never seen one before. Well, they finally saw something that was red enough and looked enough like we expected it to be that we really believe this is the first time we're seeing one of these double detonation supernovas, for sure. We think some of the other ones were probably double detonation, but we just didn't have the evidence to say for sure it was. So this was the first time we've seen this other classification of a, a star that's going to blow up. Um, these are important stars because we get distances to other stars um, by using these white dwarfs. And the more we understand them, the more we can use um, them as standard candles, essentially. They blow up with what we think is the same brightness. But maybe these double detonation ones, maybe they're a little brighter, maybe they're a little fainter. So um, if you think something's a particular brightness and you look at it off in the distance, you can calculate its distance by how much fainter it is. Well, if you have the wattage stamp on the light bulb wrong to begin with, your distance is going to be wrong. So we need to make sure we understand these objects. Okay, onward and upward here. So yeah, so kind of in that vein with talking yeah. about supernovae and all these things that we see appear and then disappear in the sky. Uh, I really like this topic. Uh, so this, which you see here, I'll just tell you a little story about how these things are discovered and, and then talk about uh, a special kind of them. Uh, so these types of events are um, what we call transient events. They happen and they disappear. Uh, so this right here is the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and there are a few important things to, when, to remember, or three questions that are relevant for what we're doing here uh, when you're talking about identifying these things. So you want to know how bright it is, which is what you're talking about. Are they the same brightness all the time? Uh, what does it do over a long period of time, which is like all of those light curves that we saw? Um, and then is there hydrogen? But uh, so in this one, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about uh, the first uh, nova. I'll make it kind of quick, though. Uh, so the first nova was in the Andro uh, one of the first novas that we saw was in the Andromeda galaxy here. Uh, but we didn't quite know how far away the Andromeda galaxy was. Uh, so we had to kind of figure that out. Uh, but we did watch it over time as it was brightening. You see this is another light curve. And then it dimmed away. Uh, so in order to figure out how far away the Andromeda galaxy was, uh, we had to know how, 
okay, there's uh, CFID variable stars <laughs> in the Andromeda galaxy that tell us how far away it was. And thanks to uh, um, uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt, we do know um, that variable stars, they're these stars that get brighter and dimmer, and they do it over a periodic time, and, and you can tell how bright they are intrinsically, uh, which was like at a certain distance, you can tell how bright they are based on how fast they're dimming and getting brighter. Uh, so if you've ever heard of uh, crickets, uh, they actually cricket, or they make their little sound faster when it's warmer and then when it's a little bit slower when it's cooler. So it's very similar to what happens with the uh, uh, variable stars. But all that is to say is the first, um, the first measurements that they took of this nova, they thought it was very dim uh, compared to how bright it actually was. And once we got the distance, we were able to figure out uh, how bright it actually was, and they found out that it was 23,000 times brighter than what they originally thought. Uh, so it's very <laughs> important. Nova. It was a supernova, <laughs> yes. So, so all of these things are, uh, so you have to know how bright it is in order to know uh, what it is, right? So uh, that's the first question that I'm uh, trying to answer here. So we can take these, these measurements of, uh, um, with, you know, based on the distance, and we can tell how bright these things are. Uh, so that's one way to help identify some of these transient objects. Uh, so here, uh, this is Mount Wilson. That's where, uh, actually, we discovered that the universe, or that in the Andromeda galaxy was much farther away, which is really exciting also because of Mount Wilson. Uh, so. Yeah, so we watched these things appear and then disappear. Uh, and the other thing that we were talking about was how what they do over time. So this was taken over a few days, and you can see it gets really bright, and then it disappears, and you take measurements of it, and that's what those light curves that we were talking about, uh, where you watch how it dims out over time. That's very important because some things dim out at the same speed, um, and other things take longer, depending on what they are, how you identify what they are. Um, so there's also spectra. So what is there hydrogen is the last question. So uh, this is a spectra. You see all the pretty colors. This is actually a rainbow that you can look at a star, or look, at, uh, look at how it brightens and then disappears, and it'll change over time. So these are actually uh, different measurements on different days, and you can see that spectra changes. Uh, so what that star is composed of, all the things that are in it, are uh, you know, things that, that are glowing. You can see they're changing over time. So very exciting. Uh, so there is something that you see in uh, very specific types of supernovae. Uh, so when a supernova has the hydrogen line that you see there, so that red color, uh, you can classify them as a type 2 supernova. So that's the types, one of the types we were talking about. Uh, so type 2 supernova are known as the uh, core collapse supernovae. So those are the ones that are just really massive, and then they just explode because uh, the inner shell, uh, there's a lot of pressure, all that good stuff. So uh, they're really massive stars, and they, they run out of fuel at the center, and then they collapse. Uh, and this is the Crab Nebula, which is an example of one of those. So this one uh, had hydrogen. Uh, but there's also other types of supernovae uh, like you were talking about, they don't have hydrogen. So when you look at that spectra, that rainbow, you're not going to see that red line, mm -hmm. at least in the same way that you would if there was hydrogen there. Uh, so you can see that the animation basically of the one that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is how you would identify them. And the reason that that's important is that uh, they are very much the same brightness about. So uh, how bright is it? So how are you going to identify this thing? It's, if it's the same brightness as all of the other type 1a supernovae, then you know it's probably a type 1a supernova. Uh, so this is a light curve of type 1a supernova. And it's uh, normalized a little bit, but you can see that they are, this is a bunch of different type 1a supernova. And they're, they are actually really, really similar to each other. Colors? Uh, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the different colors are different supernovae, but so the, you can see how similar they are to each other. So that's why we use them to actually uh, determine how far away things are, is that we know how bright they are, uh, so we can tell, uh, how, you know, you hold a candle in front of you and then you hold it a mile away, of course it's going to be dimmer when it's farther away, but you know how bright a candle is approximately. Especially if it's a standard candle. A standard <laughs> candle, <laughs> yes. It's a term we use yeah. for these objects, we call yeah. them standard yeah. candles. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, so yeah, and now you are all supernovae scientists, uh, so <laughs> you know how to identify, uh, you know, different types of supernovae, except uh, there's a lot more. <laughs> it gets really complicated, but, you know, kind of the basic idea. So all of this is to say uh, that we can tell when things are supernovae and when they're not. 
for the most part. So mm -hmm. these events are called uh, tidal disruption events, um, and they do appear and then they disappear. They stay bright for a while. You can take light curves of them, uh, and they are basically when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole. Uh, it brightens. You can see it uh, in uh, different wavelengths of light. Uh, so you need a big telescope, though, because uh, most these super most super massive black holes are going to be at the centers of other galaxies. So they are oh usually all pretty far away. They're actually pretty rare events. They only happen uh, like I think they only have about sixty of them total, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, yeah, supernovae though happen. Uh, we see hundreds of them every year. So this is much more rare. Uh, so. Basically, what happens is when a star gets too close, you, it spaghettifies. <laughs> uh, so it'll be stretched apart, and it's a lot like uh, you've probably seen Interstellar, black holes. Uh, so yeah, so the team that we're talking about in Syracuse University, uh, they actually were trying to identify different ways of, uh, different types of these events. So there were some of them that last for years and they come back. Uh, and then there's others that dim out after a period of like maybe 20 to 50 days. And they wanted to figure out if there was something about the stars that were falling into these black holes that they could identify based on the light curves and the, uh, and the spectra that we got from them. So they were, they were actually able to tell that it's, uh, they have a specific model and they were testing it. And that model did pretty well. And they said that it doesn't actually matter what type of star is going in there, but you can change the type of black hole, change how big and massive it is, and it will change the length of that, uh, of that, that, that tidal disruption event that we're talking about. So... Uh, but they had a lot of other findings. They were testing the, the model that they had, and the model did pretty well, so good for them. <laughs> yeah. Well, interesting stuff. So you can have supernovae that we can track because they hit the brightness and they mm -hmm. fade the right way. And then these things that be, can be confused with mm -hmm. a supernova, but they don't fade the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually a star being stripped apart. So yep. stars are dying in both cases. Though. Yes, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, sometimes sometimes there's something left behind, and that, that was another part of their, their research where they said, saw what the difference was when it was completely destroyed and when it was only partially destroyed. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. So yeah. this is why we go to these meetings. Um, I don't study things like tidal disruption events. Um, never did. But when I would go to the double S meeting, you go through the list of topics and say, wow, this sounds like it'll be fun to go see. And you go sit in on the, on the talk. So back to our roadmap here of a star's life. In the center, again, we made the stars. We made the protostars. We had some massive stars. Well, some of those massive stars do blow up as those type 2 supernova. Like Vanessa said, they run out of fuel in their core. And you have all that gravity trying to squish them. And if you don't have energy to hold up that mass, something's got to give. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the structure of the star. It collapses and then blows up. It kind of rebounds, we think. Mm -hmm. Well, other stars, um, like you said, can just be torn apart by a black hole or maybe mm -hmm. live their life and think, I'm going to be a happy white dwarf. But then their companion comes along and <laughs> smashes into them. So a lot of things can happen. But those type 2 supernovae can leave behind some really beautiful remnants. Mm -hmm. This is the Cassiopeia A remnant. And this light was combined from, well, x-rays all the way down to um, infrared. So this is covering a broad swath of the spectrum from visible light, mm -hmm. uh, the stars are invisible light, to this remnant glows in many different wavelengths. Um, and we can learn a lot about it. You can see here, um, well, the blue channel as it is, is measuring some of the highest energies. And then you're adding in even more colors that are mapping different elements, believe it or not. So the silicon-rich debris is that yellowish color. You can see the blast wave up at the top is sort of the shock wave mm. that's happening. That superheated x-ray yeah, gas. Yeah, superheated x-ray gas that that blast wave, the shock wave, heats it up and it glows in the x-rays. You have iron-rich debris that's has the reddish color. Um, and then that green monster outlined. And again, I'm not sure why they <laughs> called it the green monster. Um, <laughs> But the important thing about this is the fact that they can map the locations of these different elements. Now, why is there silicon? Why is there iron? Why is all that stuff there? Well, believe it or not, these things are created in the explosion. The star was down there cranking away, making heavier and heavier elements through fusion as its energy source. Well, that stuff isn't going to get out into the universe unless the star blows up. 
But when that star blows up, you send a shock wave through the outer layers of the star. You make a whole bunch of heavy elements, and that stuff gets mixed back in to that star forming region. And now we're finally to the point of why these are circles. This is like a big recycling system. You may have your star forming nebula, you make your stars, you make your red giant as the star dies, you blow off your planetary nebula. Well, that stuff that was blown off the outer layers goes back into a star forming nebula and can make a next generation of stars. That white dwarf star, if it has material dumped on it, it can explode and that material is enriched it creates iron, it creates calcium, all these heavy elements. And then that stuff goes back into the star forming nebula. And that next generation of stars has heavier elements in it. So this, the universe is self enriching. It is creating the heavier and heavier elements. When the universe first formed, you couldn't make a planet like Earth. You just couldn't do it. Um, in fact, this is a, a periodic table here. We have one in our building, of course. This one's been color coded though by where the elements come from. You can see anything blue. That was made in the Big Bang. Big Bang made hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, you can see. Well, dying low mass stars make most of the lithium in the universe, believe it or not. They make most of the carbon and the nitrogen, um, anything that's mostly green in there. Well, dying low mass stars, um, there's a lot of them, but not many have died. Low mass stars actually take a long time to die. Massive, massive stars, exploding high mass stars, they live very short lives. So the universe has made lots of that you know, oxygen, um, neon, all those things are very common, potassium. Um, believe it or not, merging neutron stars, a couple of neutron stars, it takes a supermassive star to explode to make one of these. They make the bling. <laughs> they make the platinum and the gold and the whatever. So really rare events make these rare elements. Coincidence? Probably not. The reason gold is rare goes all the way back to the fact that it took a rare event in the universe to make the stuff. Mm -hmm. And then that got mixed into the nebula that then made the sun mm -hmm. and the earth formed out of. So it all goes back to the cosmos. Yeah. I, um, what I like to do when we're presenting the periodic table here at Griffith is I like to tell people that we, we call everything that's not hydrogen ash. And there's a very yeah. common mythology of something that comes back from its own ashes. So mm -hmm. I like to say that stars are like phoenixes. They literally yeah. recycle themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. Well, what if we go all the way back? Do we have evidence for this? Well, yes. Um, recently, this was one of the things that was presented at this meeting. This is a star. You can have an average star out there. Well, they took a spectrum of it. What we've been talking about, you keep hearing this word spectra, spectrum. You know, divide the star into, into a rainbow, essentially, and you measure how much light you're getting at each color. And the elements that are in the atmosphere of these stars absorb certain colors, just like Vanessa was showing. Um, we can measure how much of the stuff is in the star, how much is in the atmosphere. By the way, if you heat up that atmosphere, it'll glow, and those elements will glow just like, just like the, the methane glowed in, mm -hmm. the, in the brown dwarf. Mm -hmm. If you add energy, you can make these atmospheres glow. Well, this star had a weird pattern of elements, a weird ratio of carbon to zirconium to platinum to, you know, well, PD is lead, I guess. It's not platinum lead to molybdenum MN. <laughs> um, anyway, iron is Fe. That's an easy one for me to say. So, but it had a weird ratio. I'm like, how the heck did it get this way? There must have been a star that exploded that made a weird ratio of these elements. The type 1 supernovae make a certain type of element signature. The type 2 make a different type of signature. This star has no, no signature of a type 1 or a type 2. We think that where it got its heavy elements was from a weird kind of star that formed in the very beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. Initially, the universe was not capable of making stars like the sun but it could make stars that we can't make now. Well, we make, we don't make stars at all, but the universe <laughs> makes. Um, a super, super massive star, something that's 80, 90, 100 solar masses in size. That Eta Carina we're talking about is what, 50, 60 solar masses, mm -hmm. I think? You get much bigger than that, the light that's being created, the energy that's being created literally blows the star apart. It's called the Eddington limit, and the star, you can't make a star more massive. Well, if you don't have iron in the atmosphere and you don't have all these heavy elements, you can make them bigger if you just have hydrogen and helium. So the universe only had hydrogen and helium initially. We think you could make stars that were 80 solar masses in size. And when one of those blows up, you get a weird ratio of elements because it's not like these other exploding stars we've talked about. We think we're finally seeing evidence of this. They finally saw evidence of this first generation of exploding stars. We'd never seen it before. And it was presented for the first time in New Orleans. 
So does this mean that like all stars we see today have fingerprints of the generations of stars that came before yeah, them? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Perfectly phrased. Yeah, we are the sun is many generations down the line. We formed about, you know, four and a half billion years ago, 4.6 billion years ago or so. Um, the universe was about 9 billion years old, give or take. Well, you could have a lot of generations of stars in 9 billion years. In fact, that's what's going on along our cosmic connection, our jewelry here at Griffith Observatory. You see that we form the initial thing, you make some galaxies, and then there's a long section where we have nothing. Well, what's actually happening through there is you're making generation of stars after generations of stars. They're exploding, they're enriching the gas, and without that happening, you actually cannot make a star like the sun. Hmm. So we leave that out because we want people walking through the hallway. We don't want to have a, a traffic jam there. And it's not directly related to the sun, but the things are happening. So the real upshot of all of this, this is our own graphic here, but the other one was a, a little easier for me to follow. But I just like the colors of this in the cycle. You can see the blue is a blue massive star. It'll, it'll shine very brightly. It'll swell into a red supergiant and explode, perhaps as a type two supernova, leaving behind a black hole or maybe a neutron star. A sun-like star, a smaller one, um, it will form a planetary nebula after it swells as a red giant, leaving behind one of those white dwarfs that our sun is alone. It has no companion to dump any material on it. So that white dwarf will just slowly fade from view, becoming a black dwarf eventually. A few yeah. trillion years. A few trillion years, which brings <laughs> us to the red dwarf in this diagram. We've added this on, and you can see it just red dwarf. It's hanging out there. That's because the smallest red dwarfs, not enough time has passed for any of them to die. We have models about what we think will happen, but we have no <laughs> evidence that the smallest are right. They probably are. We know stellar astrophysics better than we understand things like even the insides of planets. We don't understand you know, earthquakes, but we understand stars pretty well. The physics is really, really good. So this is, um, you know, this is our picture of what's going on, the, the generations of stars enriching the gas, making the next generation, and making planets and maybe life at other places out there. So, um, but a fascinating AAS meeting this year. Um, the press conferences were great. Well, I just want to thank the three of you for your contributions tonight, Rosemary, Paul, Vanessa. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight um, at All Space Considered. Thank you, everybody out there. Thank you to our audience. And um, I want to thank, of course, our foundation, our nonprofit partner, our exclusive nonprofit partner, all the members. I want to thank our YouTube audience that has been watching us tonight. And of course, um, thanks to everybody here. So thank you for joining us. Um, we'll see you next month. What a stellar time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Truly enlightening. Pretty good. Pretty good.